Hi everyone, welcome back to the Caso Solicitors uh, Employment uh, Dismissal Series and today we're going to be dealing with a really hot topic, uh, malingering. And uh, malingering can, or suspicion of malingering, can cause uh, a huge amount of friction in the workplace. Let's start off with the definition of uh, malingering, and this is not a legal definition, this is just the Oxford English Dictionary. It's defined as uh, pretending to be ill in order to escape from some duty or from uh, employment. Now, you could add these days, I would argue, uh, that it's also to obtain compensation in many cases. Now, the benefits of proving malingering can be, the, the financial benefits of proving malingering to an employer can be very substantial. For example, if you can show that an employee who's claiming to be disabled is in fact malingering, uh, you could save yourself, uh, the employer could save themselves a very substantial sum in reasonable adjustments. Um, you save money obviously on long-term sick pay and notice pay and obviously if you can prove malingering then things like share options and pension schemes uh, if there's any give or take that's likely to fall in the employer's favour. Now what can you as an employer do if you suspect malingering? Well my first piece of advice is um, don't write for any sort of report, uh, and a, a lot of employers do this, to the uh, employee's GP. Uh, that employee may have had a relationship of 30 years with that GP. Uh, the GP's first obligation is to their patient, not, not, not to people who are asking them questions about the patient. Uh, and also, the GP will be aware that if they give a negative report about a patient, um, they are quite likely to be the subject to a complaint by that patient. So that's a complete waste of time. Uh, the first step is to involve occupational an occupational therapist. That's the standard, uh, standard first step for an employer. And the occupational therapist needs to be carefully briefed uh, as to exactly what it is uh, you're looking for. Uh, but that's normally not the end of the story. It could be if you're lucky, uh, but a lot of employees or some employees, well, no, no, what I meant to say was a lot of employees who are malingerers can be quite experienced at it. For example, occupational health, uh, if the employee is claiming to be depressed, occupational health are quite likely to go through a standard uh, question and answer routine, um, which uh, and I've got one off the web here, it's called Patient Health Questionnaire. And it goes through, you probably can't read it from there, but it goes through very standard questions, uh, such as, over the last two weeks, how often have you been bothered by any of the following problems? Little interest or pleasure in doing things, not at all, several days, more than half the days, nearly every day. Feeling down, depressed or hopeless, same answer choice. Trouble falling or staying asleep or sleeping too much, same answer choice. Feeling tired or having little energy, same answer choice. Now, most, uh, a lot of employee malingerers who are um, experienced at malingering, they're obviously, they'll, they'll have been on the web and they'll have looked up these questions so they'll know what the answers are. So, occupational uh, health is, is, is a consultant is only your first uh, step. Now, you need to put that report together with some other things you should be looking for uh, to help you get to the next stage, uh, which is a more formal type of uh, medical report. So what you should be looking for, typical evidential uh, things that come out with uh, cases against uh, malingerers are um, a vague report of symptoms. Um, a lot of people, when they're speaking to somebody who's interested about their illnesses, uh, will give quite a lot of information. People who give vague, short replies, um, that's a clue that um, there may be malingering there. Um, unexplained comments in medical records uh, is another clue. If the medical records don't, don't really tell you what's going on, um, medical records inconsistent with the employee's story. So the employee says, for example, 
they've never been depressed before, but and it's work that's made them depressed. But you see in the medical report that there are uh, other instances of depression in the past. Um, the blaming the illness or on the employment where there, there is other evidence you can obtain, such as an open Facebook page, uh, which shows that's not true. So, for example, if an employee says that they're depressed because of the amount of work they've been given, but you then see on their open Facebook page um, that they have, for instance, just been through a very long divorce, they can't obtain contact with their children, and other potential sources of depression. Uh, malingerers often fail to attend medical appointments. They've normally got a good excuse, but there is a, a, a consistent pattern of failure. Um, malingerers often uh, fail to follow uh, treatment plans um, and because they know it's not really necessary for them to follow, they know it's a complete waste of time. Um, so, as I say, malingerers are more less, less likely to follow treatment plans. Um, covert surveillance, that's a tricky area. Um, you need to get all your evidence together, I would suggest, and take legal advice uh, before you engage on covert surveillance. Uh, covert surveillance can be admissible in an employment tribunal, um, but that, that's a complicated uh, topic for another, another day, really. I would take advice before engaging in covert surveillance because if you covertly su surveil an employer, an employee without their permission, um, that could be seen as a breach of the um, employer's implied duty uh, of trust and confidence. So if an action taken by an employer uh, damages the employer-employee relationship, without good reason, without a good cause, uh, then that's usually uh, a breach of that, of that covenant that's implied into the employment contract. So you need to be careful about that. Uh, next steps, if your examination and your investigations give you a reasonable ground to believe that there is malingering happening, um, then my advice is to refer it up to the next step, which is to obtain a formal medical report. Uh, I'm not going to deal in this interview with how you get a formal medical report and neither am I going to deal with in this, in this um, video about what, how you can treat it if the employee refuses. We'll deal with that another day because that's quite a complicated subject again. But let's assume that you can get uh, a medical report. You may have a clause in your contract uh, which compels the employee to attend a medical examination on, on the employer's say-so, uh, that's often a good nudge, even if it's not uh, absolutely strictly enforceable. Um, so let's say you have got the, the, the employee is willing to go for a medical examination, or you've persuaded them to go for a medical examination. The medical examination you want to obtain is called symptom validity testing. So you want to send them to a recognised expert uh, in the field who can test to see whether the symptoms are valid or not. Um, Hugh Koch Associates is, is a recognised uh, expert for anxiety and depression in the employment field. Um, I used to know a surgeon, I think he's retired now, but I used to know a surgeon who, in, in, the, in the case of bad backs, he used to have what he called his special chair. And it was a chair he'd asked the employee to sit in um, if they complained that they had a, a very common complaint in the lower lumbar, the slip disc or something. And it was a chair that you actually couldn't sit in uh, if you had that complaint. Um, another test, just to give you an example, is something called the coaxial compression test, where the uh, uh, medical surgeon presses down on the head of the malingerer and ask them if it hurts their back and they report that it does. In fact, pressing down on the top of the head would not cause, uh, would not cause pain in a, in a lower back injury. So you need to get on to symptom validity testing and if you can show, if you, if you can show on a balance of probabilities that the employee is malingering, uh, you then need to go into a, a disciplinary uh, procedure uh, there is a case called uh, a JAJ 
and Metroline West in 2015, uh, which is an absolute copper-plated ratio um, that says that uh, malingering uh, can always be a misconduct uh, and could justify a dismissal. So that's the end of uh, malingering and I look forward to seeing you again next time and we'll get through some of the uh, more technical uh, areas around uh, capability and uh, sickness dismissals.